Now let's move on to semantic segmentation. There have been a few attempts to semantic segmentation also before the deep learning era, but the performance of these approaches is nowhere near comparable to the performance of deep methods. So we're going to focus on deep methods in this unit. Let's remind ourselves again, what is the problem? The problem is given an input image that is not shown here, but you can imagine what it looks like. To classify or assign a semantic label to every pixel in that image. So for example, this pixel here, we want to associate with the class sky, which might be label number five. And this uh, pixel here, we want to associate with the uh, label grass, which might be pixel number 13, and so on. This is the goal. And we want to do this for both objects like cars and stuff uh, categories like sky. In 2015, um, a group at Berkeley uh, realized that actually we, we can obtain semantic segmentation using a classification network. They observed that given the, 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 the very strong performance of image classification networks, why can't we just apply those classification networks in a convolutional manner on larger images? And instead of producing a one by one output, which is turned into a probability distribution, as we have seen in the previous slides, um, return a, a feature map that is converted into uh, several heat maps, one heat map per category. Here is the heat map for Tabby Cat. And as you can see now, in addition to the classification results, we have some red pixels that indicate strong probability for the presence of Tabby Cat. We also know where the presence of this class is because we have applied this network here in a convolutional manner, in a sliding window manner over this image. But of course we have implemented it as a big convolutional network. And so we have this heat map here that tells us for the category Tabby Cat, um, where there is high probability for that category. So we apply a classification network in a convolutional fashion. They call it convolutionalization in the paper. This is a figure from the paper. In order to obtain class heat maps, and we have such heat maps for each category, of course. And then we can use simply a cross entropy loss at every pixel of the output here of these heat maps and sum over all these classification losses. Right? So training is the same as a classification network, except that now we have a sum over losses where we have one classification loss for each of these pixels in this stack of heat maps. However, the problem, as we can already see from here, is that the output heat maps are really low resolution due to all the downsampling that takes place in the neural network in order to achieve a large receptive field that is necessary in order to actually recognize the object. However, using only convolutional filters without any downsampling does not work in practice due to the small receptive field. In other words, I would need a huge amount of convolutional filters, hundreds of layers, in order to obtain the same large receptive field that I can obtain with just a few uh, downsampling operations such as max pooling. And this is just impossible to train, the number of parameters is too large, um, this doesn't work. And the idea therefore in this paper, and it's something that has maybe gone a little bit unnoticed, but a lot of the ideas that are present in modern semantic and instance segmentation networks are already present in this original paper from 2015. This core idea, the second core idea, apart from the convolutionalization, is to learn also an upsampling operation and combine low and high level information. So here you can see um, indicated by this grid structure, the resolution that we're operating on, here's the image. The convolutional layers are not shown 
um, just for clarity, but there's some convolution layers here, then pooling, conf, pooling, conf, pooling, and so on. And then in the most basic version here at this, from this very low resolution, we directly upsample with one layer upsampling. It's called a deconvolution, it's a transposed convolution. The inverse of a convolution is an upsampling operation. It's one form of doing upsampling. So here we upsampling directly from this very coarse resolution to this very fine resolution. And of course, the model cannot recover the fine details. But what we can do is we can upsample from here to just this resolution, um, like the next one, and then take features from that layer and combine them, add them or concatenate them, and then do the same again, upsampling, the transpose convolution, the learned upsampling, and then combine with a sum or concatenation with the features at that level. And therefore, because these features here already contain some information about the edges, some high frequency local feature information, we get sharper boundaries. And this is illustrated here. Fusing information from layers with different strides improves detail. Here's this very simple variant and here is the variant that fuses these uh, features from the layers with the different strides. However, as you can still see from these results, even for relatively simple examples, the output is still relatively coarse. This is 2015. This is the first approach to the problem, still beating all of the state of the art uh, uh, in terms of classical approaches. And then from there on, of course, the quality improved. Here's another model that has been developed around the same time concurrently. They all have a similar architecture. It's all an encoder. We have this, this part of the network that is contracting where the spatial dimension is reduced and the feature channel number is increased. And then there is a, um, an expansion part here on the right where it's called a decoder where information is decoded back up to the highest resolution and there's these skip connections. In this case, they, they skip just the pooling indices um, uh, in order to retain uh, high detail. So there's a couple of different ways to do these skip connections. Um, so for example, like for the upsampling operation, we can do nearest neighbor upsampling or bed of nails upsampling or bilinear upsampling. But what they did in this particular SEC network is they used these pooling indices that they basically in every pooling operation, they remember which element was activating um, maximally. There's a max pooling operation. So in this case, this element. And then in the unpooling operation, we injected this information by unpooling into that location. So for example, here, the six was most strongly activated. So the four in the respective unpooling operation gets inserted here. Here, the three is most active or most, most strongly activated. And so the one in the respective at the same resolution unpooling operation gets inserted at that same location. So for unpooling, remember which element was the maximum during pooling. Um, and this is where the location where the element is inserted. And here's some results of the segment model. And it compares also to the fully convolutional model. And you can see that this particular type of skipping um, improves results. An alternative to downsampling and upsampling or a model that can be used in combination actually is a so-called dilated convolutions. They are an alternative um, to this combined down and up sampling because they allow to reach a large receptive field size relatively quickly just with convolutions. Dilated convolutions increase the receptive field of standard convolutions without actually increasing the number of parameters. This is key. Without increasing the number of parameters, I can increase the kernel, the receptive field. Um, and this is the core idea of dilated convolutions. And therefore, a network with dilated convolutions is able to perform image level predictions, for example, in semantic segmentation, without upsampling and downsampling in theory. In practice, now, even in this work here where this idea has been presented, has been presented concurrently in multiple works. So even in, in this work here, for example, 
they still required a standard unit backbone and, and could just do this on top to refine the segmentation. But then they could get much, much more details and much better quality. How does the dilated convolution look like? Well, we have a dilation factor here. This is in this case, dilation factor is two. And that distributes the sampling of the input signal. It's the previous layer, this is the next layer. So we increase the receptive field size because we're effectively skipping some locations. So at the expense of skipping some locations and potentially also intru introducing some, some artifacts, some mosaicing, some aliasing artifacts, um, we are increasing the receptive field, but we are not increasing the number of parameters. This kernel still has three by three times the number of channel parameters, no matter what the dilation factor is. And that's the crucial thing. We can now ch use even higher dilation factors and get larger receptive fields and combine this. And here are some results. So you can see this is the uh, FCN, the, the basic version. Uh, no, this is the FCN, uh, the fine version. This is the uh, deep lab um, model. And here is the is, is, a, is one of these state of the art uh, backbones combined with the dilated convolution as the front end. You can see that this model achieves much higher accuracy or much more detailed boundaries compared to these these models. Yeah, here's another model, also from 2015. It's called a U network. Very simple, very similar ideas. Also, one of the standard models. This is also has an encoder, has a decoder, has skip connections. But in this case here, the skip connections are concatenating the features from the respective, from the same resolution, um, with the um, upsampling predictions from the previous resolution in the decoder here. The white and the blue. The white comes from the previous. Uh, encoder layers at the same resolution. And then this is concatenated with the upsampled result of the decoder stage here. And this is one of the de facto standard architectures for many tasks with image level outputs, such as depth estimation or segmentation. Here's a work where semantic segmentation uh, has been tried to be made temporally consistent. If I apply a semantic segmentation algorithm, it's not necessarily semantically uh, temporally consistent because I apply it to each frame independently. And so there's a lot of flickering artifacts and a lot of noise, noise going on. But here they optimized um, this model to be temporally consistent as well. And the results, even for this is 2016, are, are really, really quite impressive, I think. So I let this play for 10 seconds. This is on the Cityscapes data set. Here is the Cityscapes leaderboard. This is one of the standard benchmarks for evaluating semantic segmentation methods in the context of self-driving. And you can see like what are, what is the state of the art. There's a lot of methods ranked on the leaderboard. You have to submit your results um, on a data set, a, a test set for which the ground truth is not available. And the server evaluates your method, similar to uh, the ImageNet challenge or the Kitty data set. And um, then it, you, uh, it, it creates a number and you can put your entry, your method into that table. And the, the measures that are used for evaluation of semantic segmentation methods are the simplest is per pixel accuracy, just measure how many pixels are correct, but that's not used very often. More frequent these days are per class Jakar index or intersection over union. This is uh, basically for each semantic class we measure um, true positives and false positives and true negatives and false negatives in terms of for that semantic class um, comparing ground truth to the prediction. Um, and this is also um, a metric that we'll talk about a little bit more in the detection unit later on. 
And uh, then because some of the semantic classes due to the perspective projection and to the size of these classes are uh, very small, occupy only a few pixels, there's also metrics that weight them relative to the instance size. And here are results of a state-of-the-art multi-scale approach as of 2021, which is currently ranked fourth on Cityscapes. And you can appreciate all the details that are predicted by this model at really high resolution. You can see, for example, this pedestrian, these traffic lights here, these signs, um, the boundaries of the trees, of the buildings, of the cars, etc. It's really amazing what these deep neural networks for semantic segmentation are able to achieve these days. And what I mentioned already in the beginning, one task that is uh, basically uh, combining uh, different, uh, you know, the combining the semantic segmentation problem with the instant segmentation problem that we are going to discuss later in, in, in the lecture is called panoptic segmentation. So here the goal is to predict for each pixel the semantic category and both uh, um, for both the stuff and the objects as well as the instance label if there is an object um, below this pixel. So this is called panoptic segmentation. 